starting the broadcast. Oh, says we're live. Okay, great. Well, hopefully we're live with lots of people all over the world. Uh, this is Jean Lidka, and uh, for once, you're not seeing a video of me. Uh, you're seeing me live here from Charlottesville, Virginia. And we ha are joined by lots of people, but uh, a group of folks who are going to be talking with me and asking questions and kind of just generally, I hope, having a great conversation. So we have joining us Clive, Damola, Lisa, Ramesh, and Stefano. So thank you guys for showing up early and uh, and talking with us. So so I, I was thinking maybe one way to do it would be just to start asking questions, some interesting questions that have been on your mind that, that you'd like to talk some more about that maybe haven't been covered in the class so far um, as much as you like. And uh, so I thought maybe, Lisa, would you like to get us started with the first question? Lisa, yeah, she's, you're, you're mute, Lisa. You're muted, Lisa, so you got to unmute. Uh, oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, caught off guard there. <laughs> uh, well, my first question was uh, uh, about corporate strategy. Well, typically, corporate strategy makes use of traditional techniques, you know, brain, uh, typical brainstorming, SWOT, uh, PEST, you know, all those techniques. And I was wondering if you have a first-hand experience using design thinking uh, for formulating a vision or strategic focus. Um, is, is that something out of the box? Yeah. Oh, so I forgot to ask you to tell us where you're from, Lisa. Oh, I'm from Perth, Australia. Perth, Australia. Cool. Okay. Great. Well, you know, I, I, I have to say this is a setup because Lisa sent me that question in advance, and I love that question because, of course, I'm a strategy person. I'm a strategy professor. That's that's what I teach most of the time, and um, and I kind of found design thinking later. Uh, and one of the things that's exciting to me is this idea of how would we blend design thinking into traditional strategy work because yeah, as we've talked about in the class um, I think there's a real role for bringing the qualitative focus of design thinking and the human focus combining that with the more quantitative traditional market analysis focus that we usually use in strategy. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity to bring those two together. My favorite definition of design is really this idea that design, great designs happen at the intersection of three things, the possibilities, constraints, and uncertainties. And great strategy happens there too. I mean, that's the wonderful part. A great strategy is nothing more than a great design that people are enthusiastic enough to uh, to, to really tap into and so I think so much of our traditional strategy thinking does start with constraints you know what's the budget we've got to work with what do we know uh, already in the market that consumers definitely want all these kinds of things um, and so design thinking I think gives us a chance to go deep in an area of opportunity to really come up with, I think, much more innovative strategy uh, to serve particular groups of people. And of course, design thinking is always about particular groups of people. And I think sometimes in strategy, you know, we define our targets as huge. And I mean, how would you go and do journey mapping on like a target that you defined as like, you know, some giant segment, right? You kind of have to narrow it down to use design thinking techniques, but but I think that, that they could really be used well. Um, certainly, for those of you who follow Roger Martin, this is Roger's latest book on strategy that he's written with A.G. Lackley, who's the, um, you know, the former CEO and now the new CEO again of p and um, Yeah, I think I'm just going to unmute you guys for a second because uh, you're getting some back noise. Okay. I don't want to. But. Okay. Um, I agree. And then people can unmute themselves. Yeah. Okay. The reason is. Okay. Yeah. 
that's where the sound's coming from. Nobody else. You can probably unmute everybody else. Okay. Okay. So anyhow, so that's one thing. I think in the front end, how we look for areas of opportunity and learn more about them. Then I think as we begin to have communications about strategy with people, a lot of the design tools like storytelling are really, really powerful. And I do have one uh, example that I've written a case on in that, and that's an example of how SAP, you know, the giant enterprise software company. The giant enterprise software company um, uh, had brought their strategy development people, who are mostly very traditional strategy, ex-consultant types, with their design services people when they were formulating a strategy for what would what should their response to web 2.0 be and what they combined was traditional strategy analysis so there'd be some information on market size but then they would go deep on how a particular customer in that market was reacting and and their challenges and how SAP products could help them right then they would go to a different level of depth on competitors and who else were they competing against that was trying to help them with that right so so I was really impressed by that story of how you could create a different kind of strategic conversation in part by instead of giving people our traditional you know here's the strategy here's the eight bullet points let's tell a story and let's you know move levels. Let's tell the co competition story. Let's tell the market growth rate story. But then let's tell the story about you know John in this market who's trying to accomplish this specific thing and how our product could make a difference for him. And that's how SAP used it. And their reaction was that it was a completely different kind of conversation. And people, managers, got excited about being part of that conversation instead of the conversation about here's, you know, here we're going to tell you about the new strategy. So these are the things you're going to have to do. So, so I think you're really on to something, Lisa. And I think there's a lot of potential. Um, and one of my goals uh, is to go back into the field and do some research and find people who are using it for strategy. So if anybody out there listening knows of a company or if their company is trying to blend some of the design thinking into their strategy processes, please let me know about it because I would just love to learn more about that um, so that I could share it with, with other people who have interests like yours. Great. Well, Is that, that helpful? That's good. Great. Yes. Great. Do you plan to write a book about it? Oh, someday. Yes. Yes, that's one of my hopes. Um, We've, uh, you know, we've got a new book coming out that we've put a lot of effort into to create a project field book to go with Designing for Growth. Because our experience working with managers has been that um, even though we try and lay out the four questions and the ten tools, that from a project management view, they have found it hard to kind of connect the tools and move from one question to the other. So we've been spending most of our time trying to create this, uh, this kind of project management tool field book that would be very specific. And that's done now. And it's, you know, off at the press getting printed. So my next, my, you know, my next project then I think is really to go look for stories and strategy. And as soon as I find enough stories to make a book, I'll write it. So so the sooner you send me stories, the sooner I'll write the book. Great. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. Um, should we maybe go to Stefano? Uh, Stefano, I know that you've uh, uh, you, you were, I think you were the first one on the call. So, yeah, I was yeah. looking forward for this event. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have a question you'd like to talk about? Yeah, first of all, I'm Italian, but I live in Dublin. Huh. Wow. Uh, just to introduce myself. And uh, my question is framed around the idea of strategy. It's still the fact that, you know, your background is in strategy. I, I've been studying Michael Porter for a while. And recently, in, in one of his interviews, he just said that uh, we know pretty much a lot about strategy in the way that what strategy means for a company in a precise, precise time, in a certain time. But we don't know exactly how strategy is yet formed. And is this correct saying that? In a way, design thinking trying to unfold the process with which an entrepreneur or a, a large organization achieve that strategy. Yeah. Well, uh, it, please keep going, Stefano. Sorry to interrupt. 
And that would be like the, the first question. And the second question, because they can somehow like, the fact that I'm going to be enterprise where we have a lot of entrepreneurs. And I try to facilitate some of the concepts that have been you know, created for larger organizations to these enterprise centers, where you start entrepreneurs that are trying to create an innovation business model. And um, something that might be interesting of you is the fact that now we have a lot of career managers that it's not that they were born genetically of being entrepreneurs, but they have been laid out of the organization, they, and they start to be entrepreneurs when they are in their 50s. And it's amazing, like, their mindset is pretty much fixed because they've been raised in a silos. So is that something that, in your opinion, makes sense to start to facilitate an agenda, not for you know, international corporations, but for normal people or managers that start their own journey as entrepreneurs? Yeah, great. I, I do think they're, they're very related questions because, to me, whether you're talking about uh, an entrepreneur who's kind of trying to start their own business from scratch, or whether you're talking about a large organization, or even a, you know a social sector organization, or your own personal strategy, right? Think about, I mean, strategy is kind of the same thing at whatever level we're operating at, and strategy to me is always about telling the truth about current reality, and then creating some as vivid as possible image of some new future that you're excited about that you can go out and try and implement right and so it's kind of a cycle you know it's a current reality make sure you aren't you know make sure you aren't making stuff up about what's really going on today then the design process is really envisioning this new future and then there's an implementation process in which, you know, we, we, we go out into a market or for a big organization, we have to change our systems and process and all to let us achieve that new future, right? Um, and so, you know, I think part of this is always designing that new future. And where does, where does the impetus for the design process of the new future come from? Oftentimes with entrepreneurs, it comes from a personal hunch they have. Right? It comes out of their own personal experiences. I think this is a great idea, and I think if I go out in the market, other people will think it's a great idea. Right? We work with a lot of students who want to be entrepreneurs here at Darden, and that's almost always how they start, with their own great idea. Design thinking, we found, can really help them go out and get some data about whether anybody else actually thinks that's a great idea, too. Right and and give allow them you know the big the big uh, term now in entrepreneurship is pivot right you try something you get something out in the market you see what the reaction is and then you have to be ready to pivot into something new right well it seems to me good design thinking research up front would reduce the frequency with which you had to pivot right because if you if you get the hypothesis right the first time because you start with good data about your customers unmet needs then the odds that you're going to have to pivot and change that dramatically when you get out in the marketplace and get some more learning go down. So I, I do think that these, these techniques can be very useful for entrepreneurs as well as large organizations um, in helping people to figure out, you know, what do we want to design the future around? Is, is, it, is it a set of users? Is it technology, right? We know there's a lot of people, does, a lot of large organizations um, look for technology breakthroughs to design a future around, right? So you can make, I think, a lot of choices about where that future that you design around comes from. But in the end, my belief is, if you haven't created a powerful strategic conversation among the people who have to implement that, then you probably won't succeed. You'll have the design of a great strategy that nobody's excited about it enough to bother coming up with all the new behaviors and doing all the hard work of implementing a new strategy. And I think design can really help there too. I think the kind of collaborative tools, I mean, I think design and, 
and some of the tools, um, like the tool I call mind mapping, which has you know set off in the forum such a, a, a such a, a lively discussion of should it be called mind mapping or should it be called something else or whatever. But whatever we call it, putting stuff up on the walls, like we've got behind us, we, we put up a couple of the posters that we've done for some uh, student project that we're doing around wellness. Uh, whenever you put stuff up on the walls and share it with people and you allow them to tour that gallery and take away their own insights and then work together as a team to say, what does this mean for the criteria to create an exciting new service or experience or product or whatever for a target market, you've you've made collaboration easier and I think that's another huge contribution I'll talk a lot more about that in our last session together in session five where I've tried to think about as a takeaway where do I really think design thinking can make the most contribution but for me clearly as I look at the way teams struggle I think that the tools of design thinking can not only contribute by helping us think about what a new future could look like, but it also can help us have a better conversation with each other in order to get aligned to work towards that new future. So that's what that's a uh, that you know that those are my thoughts uh, about about that question, Stefano. Help yeah, me. yeah. Can I add only one thing related to always to the, 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 the uh, talking about the entrepreneurs? In the before question, what is, what if, and what was, and what works, I think there is a question that comes first that is before you begin, and that was explained in your lecture in the last time. And that is the, you know, the stage where it's more complicated to engage a conversation with entrepreneurs, because they have two or three ideas, and they don't know exactly, you know, which of them might be, you know, more valuable. So is that correct to, to, to say, well, you might go through the other stages with different ideas and later on at some stage you will decide which of them is more valuable. Yeah. You know, at some point what I love about design thinking is that it, it teaches us to try and postpone making a decision as long as possible. You know, and as managers we're trained to kind of get out there and make a decision right away and the sooner you make the decision the better. But, but in an uncertain world, the longer you can postpone a decision that forces you to really commit significant resources so that you can learn, right, uh, before you make the commitment, the better, right? And so for an entrepreneur, I think, the extent to which you can kind of do low fidelity prototypes and play with multiple ideas, right, before you have to kind of really double down and begin to commit serious resources to any one of them. I think that's really the the approach that design thinking would suggest and you know it's the approach that like the Lean Startup which is currently a very popular uh, book in the US which tries to take lean thinking and apply it to startups but the major message there too it's all about experimentation you know it's all about small bets and getting better data and learning before you commit these scarce resources if you're an entrepreneur you know and your house is getting mortgaged to do this before you s commit those kind of precious resources to a new idea Perfect. okay great um, uh, let's see uh, Clive we haven't heard from you yet uh, do you have a question you'd like to talk about I'd like to just comment a little bit back on the strategy that Lisa wrote one of the questions that have been on the uh, been on the site of the uh, debate is the how we get design thinking into the organisation and strategy is one of them. But from my own experience, I think as we are, as we are going through the period of economic downturn across the world, I'm finding personally on that certain companies are now in an situation whereby they would have once perhaps not thought about are now coming onto the table. They're coming onto the table because they're forced to raise new thinking, to raise new to find the solutions to the existing problem. I think it goes back to a study that I looked at a few years ago in Stanton. And the, the, the traditional farmer And before that day, it was very much an Asian company 
but it is it's a global organization. And the change that took place has to be too much better in the times of this that's where the decisions were made. And then when it came out to assess them, it's always a lot of to move forward. Now, for those of us that are on the course that are in organisations that are actually trying to find and uh, having design thinking introduced into their structures, perhaps now is the right time to force the issue as a solution because other practical areas have not uh, performed as well as they are expected. Yeah. So that's just an observation. My only, my, my real question is. How important is having cross-gender uh, groups in the project? And the reason the question is written because you looked at the website uh, earlier on this week and you saw an MBA course and uh, and you have had if I'm right, females in the forty percent male. And I just wanted to know why you put more. Well, you were breaking up a lot, um, uh, Clyde. So let me just check what I what I think I heard you ask, which is uh, about about the the kind of gender diversity and yeah. our, and 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 I don't know what you were looking at that that you would that broke up a little bit where you said you saw it was mostly females. Yeah, so it was a uh, presentation I believe came from your office, and it was just uh, uh, a potential MBA course in design thinking. And on the uh, presentation, we had uh, a split between male and female on the course. And I found rather rightly it was 60% female and 40% male. And I just want to know if there was an importance with females on the board over males. Yeah. Well, you know, you you always hesitate to make crude gender generalizations, right? But um, it's interesting. I'll just give you two examples from my own research. So when I started to write my first book, which is on, on organic growth, so we were looking for a set of leaders who had, um, you know, that's where the George and Jeff uh, work came out of. We we're looking for a set of leaders who had a demonstrated track record of growing their businesses uh, significantly beyond the market over some period of time. So we've, we've now got about 80 managers in the database for that research, and only maybe 10 of them are women. Uh, and it, we were when we were writing the book, we really wanted to profile some of the stories told by women, but but the stories didn't lend themselves as much to to the telling to a general audience. And so, so one of the things I've always been very disappointed about in that book is that there the women managers are are hard to find in there, right? None of the long big stories are about the women managers. And we talked a lot about why that was. These are big stable corporations. The people we interviewed all had P&L roles, so we didn't know what to say. Why, why were there not more women? Well, then we went into the design thinking book, right? And the most recent book uh, that we've written on design thinking really is a case book. It's the 10 stories book, right? And I've been telling some of the stories to you uh, as part of the classes. Well, when we started the design thinking book, we were joking that we needed some token men in the book. Because when we started talking to a lot of these big organizations and you looked at who was running the design services group, it was a lot of women. I mean, Karen Hansen at Intuit doing fantastic work that's been just so impressive to me. Claudia Kochka and her work at P&G. I mean, I could just go on and on. Um, and so for us, just observing, you step back and you say, isn't that interesting? That in one piece of research, we found not so many women, and in the other piece of research, we're finding lots of women. I, I don't think it's coincidence that with design thinking's focus on kind of the human dimension and the role of emotion, these are things that, you know, women have generally been more comfortable with, and it, it feels more natural. I, I think to some extent, for some women, design thinking feels like the way they've tended to think all along, but someone's finally come along and said that was okay. 
that it was okay not to be just a hardcore business person who only looked at numbers and only did Excel spreadsheets. Um, and so I, I think that's why, um, at least in my experience, that's my hypothesis about why I tend to see more women in senior leadership roles in the design thinking area and very engaged on the product teams. Now, I think whenever you put teams together that, that don't reflect the diversity of the kind of people you're trying to serve, you get into trouble. So in many ways, you know, uh, a, a, a team of all women would be, uh, uh, you know, would be as lacking in, uh, in, the, in the diversity of perspective sometimes as a team of all men. Right? So I do think diversity is critical. I think in the teams I've seen that are most successful, diversity across function is actually more important than our traditional measures of diversity like gender and race and culture and things. Um, so I do think diversity is important, but I, I do agree with your observation. I think you've accurately observed that at least in my work, I have tended to see a disproportionate number of women relative to what I see when I look at the traditional strategy work on organic growth in the business world. So I hope that uh, I hope that answers uh, answers the question. Very much. Very much so. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, now, Ramesh, we haven't uh, heard from you yet. I wonder. Uh, I know you sent me lots of questions, so uh, your challenge is going to be to pick which one you'd most like to talk about right now. Let's see. I think maybe you're still muted. Yes, yeah. that good? Because I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we got you. Okay, right. Thanks. See, I live in uh, Bangalore, India, and I work in healthcare IT profession. So, uh, though of course I have asked uh, a lot of questions to you, and I know it's uh, not possible to answer all of them now. So you can answer them over email. <laughs> However, I have one key question here, uh, which I see as uh, got a huge potential. Um, this is again related to healthcare. Mm -hmm. See, my question is: uh, design thinking it, it starts with individual, and it scales from one one and two and seven. Right. Now, whereas, whereas uh, when it comes to patient care, care it's all it's individual. individual. And every, every patient goes through functional and emotional trauma. Now, now is this is the thinking applicable in this scenario? Now, now, I know you would say that yes, yes we can apply design thinking to a single patient, mm -hmm. but can we do this? Across every patient, and I use this in the world. Yeah. In terms well, of costs. Yes. And I think, of course, there's always a difference between what is theoretically possible and desirable versus in healthcare, for instance, where we know that 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 the nurses who care for patients are already overworked, right? And, and they, they don't have as much time as they need already. And how do, we, um, how do we think about using their time wisely and where they can use their time to get the maximum increase in wellness um, for the patient, uh, uh, given the choices they have to make with limited time across a number of patients, right? And I do think that this idea of design thinking has particularly taken root in healthcare. Uh, in the US, if we look at who is really at the leading edge of using design thinking, it is, it is far more dominated by healthcare than you would suggest if you just you know, looked at the GNP related to healthcare. Um, some of the organizations like Kaiser Permanente are doing unbelievable work. I think, uh, to bring design thinking into the patient care realm. Uh, the Mayo Clinic is doing a lot of work. The Cleveland Clinic. Uh, in fact, several years ago, we had a talk at our school in which Tim Brown from IDEO and the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic shared the stage and talked about 
how you know the challenges each faced and how they could bring some of these new tools into the setting and it was probably probably the single best talk I've ever been to at my school right it was just fascinating so I think this is just a rich rich area in which we can can really both help people improve the quality of their lives through helping them improve their wellness and really deal with a lot of these serious business and societal issues about how do we pay for all of this, right? And how do we reduce the costs while increasing the quality? And, and I think this whole challenge of how do we reduce costs while improving the quality of the experience is what design thinking is absolutely made for right because that's about finding the deep needs that are not being met today that throwing resources at them doesn't necessarily mean right so so I think you know in general I think healthcare is fantastic um, certainly we've talked about a, you know a, a, a nurse for instance as she gets to know as he or she gets to know their patient could clearly I mean in a sense they're already conducting ethnographic research they're just not doing it formally right they're not walking people through a journey map and writing down writing down what they say, but in their everyday interactions with patients, the tools of observation and interviewing to get to know people's deep needs and understand the differences across them, uh, we could certainly build more of that skill set, I think, in the day-to-day -day care that nurses offer. But we'll still bump into the time problem you talk about. For me, that's where personas can really help. Because if you can create a set of personas that capture at some level some of the differing types of needs people have, that can help a very busy nurse, I think, to more quickly and maybe more accurately assess what this particular patient needs. Right Now, will, will that assessment be inaccurate sometimes? I, obviously, right? But I think stepping from the level of the individuals to understanding perhaps there are some ways of categorizing the needs of individuals that allow us to more quickly diagnose what someone needs and respond in that way, maybe as an experiment, right? We respond, we do an initial diagnosis of which persona and then we respond in, in that way and we take the learning from, from the patient's reaction to that response and we use it to refine our next reaction um, I, I think I can see that working, but um, but I think you're right. It's an area of tremendous opportunity, and the question is, how do we go after that opportunity when we have people who are already very busy? And and I know, for instance, at Kaiser Permanente, a lot of the leadership in their design thinking area has been taken by the nurses, you know, and and uh, who have gotten really excited about this methodology and seen lots of ways to bring this method into the daily practice of patient care and use it to improve things. So, so again, I agree, this is a big challenge. There aren't a lot of obvious answers, but I do think that it's clear that there's a contribution here for design thinking, and it's probably going to take some time and lots of experiments to figure out what's the best way to get at that contribution. Okay? Oh. Yeah, if you have any links related to this uh, uh, study and experiment, uh, please forward it to me. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just looking into the work at Kaiser Permanente, for instance, there's a lot written on their work and it's it's really very interesting. So we'll, uh, I'll do that as well. Um, let's see, we haven't heard from uh, Demola yet. Uh, I know you're muted right now, Demola, but could we get you in and... Okay, and Luis to the rescue, of course. Everyone's met Luis. He's the only reason why anything ever works in this class is Luis. So, hi, Demola. Are you hearing us? Um, maybe Dar Dare as well. Uh, Dare, you you there? I think um, you are both muted. If you want to join, please um, un unmute your mics, and you come up to the screen. Dare and Demola. Thank you. Okay, we'll see if someone comes up and asks yeah, a question. Just go and okay, so maybe while uh, while uh, uh, Damola and Dare are, are thinking about this, I could take another uh, another question that that maybe someone has. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, uh, uh, maybe go to Lisa next since you started us off. And uh, do you have another question you'd like to ask, Lisa? Ah uh, yes, uh, I sent another one uh, over email. It's about. 
Design thinking, I, I know the Moses myth, <laughs> but I can't help but think about whether design thinking is more of an art than a science. You know, um, uh, is it something you, you can really learn and put some technique, you know, as long as you follow certain techniques, do you come up with a good design? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Or is, or it, is it, it for the gifted? Kind of gifted? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think design thinking, it, it's like, it's like almost anything. It's like, you know, a strategy in the same way when I teach strategy to students. Um, there are people who are naturally good at things, right? And people who have a natural gift will always be better with equivalent training of someone who just doesn't have the same kind of natural gift, right? Um, so we can teach accounting to students. Sometimes, uh, you know, I'm an accounting an accountant by training. Um, and, uh, you know, I had an aptitude for accounting and I would go to accounting class and I would get stuff that the other students in the class who didn't have that aptitude wouldn't get, right? And then I'd go to marketing and other students would get it and I would still be sitting there thinking, but wait a minute, this, I, I'm just not, this isn't making sense to me, right? So. In almost anything we go to learn, I think there are people who are naturally better at it than others. Um, and in some ways, I think of design thinking as almost being more oriented for the people who aren't naturally gifted, right? Because the people who are naturally gifted already think like designers. I mean, it, it, for instance, in our growth research, when, when we met Jeff, right? Nobody ever had to tell Jeff, oh, Jeff, go do some journey mapping. Here's a technique. Go do this. He just hung out with customers and watched what they did. For him, that was the way the world made sense, right? It didn't make any sense to him to go do a big survey. It made sense for him to hang out with customers and figure out and talk to them about stuff and show them pictures, you know? That was who he was. That is not who a lot of managers are, right? Um, uh, and, and so I think... One, we have to be realistic that you, know, you, can, you can give us both golf, you know, you can give me golf lessons and I'm not going to be Tiger Woods. You can give me soccer lessons, I'm not going to be Ronaldo. You know, I mean, there's a limit that, that you need, that you're natural, you need natural gifts to really go. You know, we teach design thinking and I'm never going to be Steve Jobs, right? Um, but can I be better than I am today? I mean, can you get me out on the golf course so I won't totally embarrass myself if you give me some, some, some lessons? I, and I try hard and I practice and all, I think so. And so when I think about design thinking, I'm thinking it's about moving towards goodness. That Martha, you know, Martha Stewart always says it, moving towards goodness. So we're moving managers towards goodness, which is giving them new tools and making them better at, at listening to customers and uncovering their deep needs and better at prototyping and better at experimenting. Now, are they going to be able to do it the way someone from IDEO or Frog or Continuum or, you know, any of the leading design firms would do it? No, they're not because those people have natural gifts added by many of them went to school for four years, right, to learn how to be designers. And, and so we're not going to, to manage to, to change that. But in my experience, most managers do not have access to real designers. Right? It, it, some, some people in lucky organizations, you know, if you work in P&G or you work in Intuit, um, you work in Kaiser Permanente, you can probably find a designer to help you do this stuff. But that's not most managers. Most managers have to teach themselves and they have to just get better at it through doing what they do. And in some ways, that's who I think of as the people that are the students that I'm trying to support. People who have to do it on their own. And so a Coursera class or a book or something on the internet, that's the only access that, that a lot of people will have to a so-called expert, you know. And, um, uh, and I really believe that we can help everybody get better and that everybody can be better at this kind of way of thinking. And even if you get just a little better, 
I think for most managers, it can really help you improve your business results and help you find opportunities to grow your business and redesign processes to make them more effective and efficient. I'm a real believer in all of that, right? Of course, yeah, it's not like I'm not biased. You know, what I, what I do for my life is try and teach, so it's, in my, it's to my advantage to always believe that everybody can learn, right, if we just work hard enough at it. So, great. Somebody, Thank you, that's comforting. comforting. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, um, I, honestly, just one final thing. I always joke that, there, you know, there's this joke that says faculty members study things that are their own issues. Right? We're all drawn to exploring stuff that's our own issues. My own issue has been I'm a very traditional business person. Like I said, I was trained as an accountant. I, I'm not a creative person. I've never thought of myself as a creative person. And that's why I think I love design thinking because it helps me do something that I'm not naturally good at. And that's why I'm so excited about bringing it to other people who are more like me than like, you know, the, the really creative uh, uh, Moses of the world. Thank you. And Ramesh, you, were, you want to jump in? Yes. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by one of your uh, video content, wherein uh, you say that starting with the constraints is limiting the what if phase. Now, obviously, we cannot create by keeping the constraints isolated and imagine a very ideal world. And by flipping this uh, constraints, uh, thinking about the constraints in a later uh, phase, I think in the what was phase, how is it going to improve our creativity? Well, I think this gets back more to my experiences around strategy implementation and change management, maybe than design thinking per se. But in my experience, accomplishing something new requires usually a lot of energy, right? And a lot of effort. The, analysis, the, the analogy we make is if you think of sending a rocket into space, a colleague of mine who has taught me everything I know about, about change management. He always tells us this analogy of, think about shooting a rocket off into space. Um, you watch them on the launch pad, right? And they're bumping up and down. There's so much energy buildup. And energy is building, building, building. And then finally, it takes off, right? And, and we know the reason why it needs all that energy is it has to break free of the Earth's atmosphere, right? Now, the amount of energy and effort it takes to rotate in space is, is very small. All the energy required is to break free of the kind of chains of gravity and get up there and, and start the new behaviors, right? I think that's true with any major change, right? If we don't build up a lot of positive energy and anticipation in advance of going into the hard stage of actually doing this stuff, then we're doomed because we haven't just built up enough energy on the launch pad to break free of all of the constraints of bureaucracy and politics and resources and all that stuff. So to me, the what if conversation, the possibilities conversation is about building up that energy on the launch pad. It's like our only hope of getting people so excited about an idea that they get really creative about figuring out how to get rid of the constraints or end run the constraints, right? And again, I think, you know, this, this point takes me back to one of the misconceptions I think about creativity and innovation. And that's that in business, the really important role of innovation is in coming up with better answers. I don't think that's true. I think the hard part in most large organizations is once you've got the answer, figuring out how to actually implement it right, how to make it happen, and the creativity really comes in there. I mean, as, as I look at our organic growth study and what made these, man helped these managers to succeed, a lot of times their ideas had already been thought of by someone else. What was different was they figured out how to get it done despite the constraints, and they got really creative about 
challenging constraints and end running them and thinking of other ways to do it. So that is why I'm such a believer in the possibilities conversation, right? And and I mean I don't think you can in business relax all constraints, right? Just just pretend that things like money don't exist and that you don't need resources to do this and go off and just dream big and unrealistically. But I think, you know, if you don't release the constraints enough to leave room for people to come up with new possibilities, then tomorrow just always looks like today and you just don't get very interesting stuff. And so so that's why I'm such a believer. You know, um, in my experience again, managers almost never get too creative, right? So you worry, well, if I tell you to think about possibilities without considering constraints, people are going to go off and come up with all kinds of crazy stuff that we're never going to be able to do, and then we're just going to have those silly conversations that are never realistic. But in my experience, most managers are already such prisoners of their own mental models that they're never really crazy. I'd always like them to be even crazier than they are. So they don't take possibilities and run like crazy when you tell them to, to pretend constraints don't exist. They still, the constraints still live in their heads and they still censor themselves and pull themselves in. So that's one of the reasons why I'm such a believer in really forcing the possibilities conversation. Because a lot of times, even if this possibility isn't doable, that way of thinking gives you a spark to another possibility that is better able to handle the constraints, right? So th that's why I think in this relationship of constraints to possibilities, for managers at least, maybe not for designers, because designers love constraints and they help them be more creative. For designers, constraints are like a green light, like go after it. But for managers, constraints are usually a red light and they say stop. Right, and so that's why I think you know trying to give them the green light for the possibilities conversation before we start worrying about the business case, which is usually the major constraint, or the execution case, um, I, I think is important. Let's see, someone else have a question that they'd uh, like to ask. I think we have a, a just about ten minutes or so left. Uh, okay. Stefano. Okay, um, just again, I want to go back to the before you begin stage, so the come before the what is stage. Now, there are four points. Identify The first point is identify an opportunity, and that is fine, it's clear. The second point is scope your project. And I find that part particularly challenging. So if it was just possible to have a word with it, uh, the third point is design your design brief, draft your design brief, and there is the project management aid, and it's very clear. And the point number four is make your plan. The, the question is, make your plan a research plan or plan what is going to happen next? I, the, que the questions you're raising, Stefano, are exactly why we've written this new field book, because those are the parts that managers have trouble with. Right. So, um, for instance, uh, I had said earlier that we uh, would post some templates uh, for some of these steps on the Design at Darden website in an email. One of the templates is a scoping template, and it walks people through a series of questions to take the area of opportunity as they've defined it, and then very systematically to go broader and say, are we sure we're not defining it too narrowly? What would be the next level up of a more broad statement? And what would that look like? And then to take it and go more narrow down one level and say, but wait a minute, maybe we're too broad and we need to make it a little bit more narrow, right? So uh, I do think that some structured way of looking at scope in which we experiment for a little bit in our heads with making the scope bigger and seeing what that looks like, and then making the scope smaller and seeing what that looks like, and based on that, kind of deciding what scope we're going to start with, but always recognizing that whatever scope we have, whatever boundaries we put around it, it's also a hypothesis. And as we get into the field and data starts to come back, we may find that the opportunity space looks very different than our initial scoping. So, so I think that's to your scoping point. To your plan point, I think there are several different plans 
that need to be made. We, we, when we say make your plans, right, there are actually different plans. There's the research plan, which is kind of the obvious one. It says basically who am I going to talk to, what am I going to ask them, who am I going to observe. If you're doing this in a team, whose responsibility is it to do this part of the work versus this part of the work. You know, a research plan, and you know, what are the timelines, how long do I have to do my journey mapping, say, or whatever. So the research plan just is a project management tool, right, that lays out clearly here's the number of people I'm going to talk to, here's where I'm going to find them, here's what I'm going to ask them or observe about them, here's whose responsibility it is on the team. So that, that's one obvious plan, I think. There's another plan that um, I just kind of call the people plan, and that's the plan around whose support do I need for this project to succeed, right? And that's usually not just the people that you're trying to create value for. It's usually other people you work with, right? It's, you know, I have to get somebody from this department to agree to something in order to help me implement this new solution, right? So my people plan says, who are the important stakeholders whose support you will need to actually roll this out if it works? right? And who you will have to also create value for. So, you know, obviously these people are like distributors, right? If you're in a value chain, it doesn't do any good to create lots of value for the end customer if you've got a distributor in the middle who doesn't like your idea and doesn't see any benefit for them in it, right? So they would be an example in the people plan of, well, I'm really going to need the support of distributors to ever move on this site, you know, eventually. So how am I going to engage them in the conversation? How do I understand what the world looks like to them? Understand maybe some of the concerns they're going to have about this? And how am I going to engage them to work with me in order to make this actually happen? Right. So I think that's the other kind of plan. And that's more of an internal project management plan. But in, you know, especially in most organizations, if you don't get the right people working with you, no matter how good the idea is for customers, you're not going to be able to make it happen, right? So that's the other plan. So I agree with you. Uh, make a plan sounds so simple when there's actually different kinds of plans that you have to make, and we need to incorporate all of them. And, and we've done, we're, we're doing a lot of hard thinking about how to help people understand the different kinds of plans and what those look like. Great. Perfect. Thank you. I think uh, Clive has a... Okay, Clive, yeah. we have time for maybe... Uh, just, uh, just Clive, just a second. Um, just to check, Demola or Dare, have you managed to come in? I see, Dare, that you are on mute. You want to try speaking now, Dare? Yes, I want to ask a question first. Can yes, you hear me? great. Yes, we can. Uh, and then you get to Clive, okay? Just start it. Come in, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one thing I've learned about uh, learning things in the world is uh, the practical use of new things. Uh, anything I learn in life, I always want to see the practical side of it, how to apply it in the, in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was learning the programming back in school, I asked myself, what would I like to write and how would I achieve it? Uh, when I was learning my the same question I asked myself. In what area can I apply this particular one? The design, thinking. Is it a kind of thing that we have now a particular plan we want to implement? We need to design it to get the whole scope about the other thing. I've been hearing the lecture talking about um, the manager, the manager, the manager. Is it all about the money? The manager. Applying this, how can that be applied? Yeah, yeah, yes. No, thank you, Dari. Um, so uh, what I hear you saying, and again, you broke up a little, but but I hear you talking about, you know, I I tend to frame all my discussions in terms of the manager, and I think you're asking, what about everybody else, right? Um, and you know, the manager is just kind of code word for me to be everybody in some ways, uh, because I have tended always to work in the, in the business world, um, 
and uh, always tended to think in terms of projects, right? I mean, this is all based on projects. When, when you're doing strategy or when you're, when you're trying to come up with new products and services, they tend to be very project-based, right? And so there's, there's somebody who's kind of in charge of running a project. So in some ways, when I say manager, I mean I'm the person who, whose project it is and who kind of runs with it. Now, sometimes there may be projects at the personal level, you're, you, you're the project manager and you're the project, right? There's nobody else on the team but you. Uh, you may be using some of these methods to figure out how to be personally more effective in your own life. So, so there's really nobody else on the team but you, um, in which case, well, really, what am I managing? Uh, I think you're managing a process, and so in some ways, when I say manager, I mean the person who's going to shepherd the process through. I don't mean the traditional definition of somebody who has people reporting to them, right? Because oftentimes with design projects, nobody on the team reports to you, right? I think that's, you know, as we look at design tends to be this incredibly cross-functional uh, uh, process where you're pulling people from all over. So, you know, the idea that, that everybody else on the team would actually work for the manager, it, it kind of never works out that way anyhow. So thank you for giving me a chance to clarify what I mean when I use the word manager, because I, I think I use it, you know, I use it very loosely, and I do use it in a way that, that I see could be confusing. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Um, now, uh, I know uh, uh, Clive, you had a, a question? Yeah, so just say, Clive. Uh, so and we, we also want to say hello to, Lin hello to Linda, who's, yeah. who's managed to join us. Hi, Linda. I'll get, I'll get you, Clive, with your question, and uh, then uh, I'll get you, Linda. Right. right. Just a second. So maybe we'll do a quick one from Clive, and then yeah. if you have a quick question, Linda, because I see we're almost out yeah, of time. Yeah. Right. Clive, you, you have to uh, mute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you one question. On and, and Clive, you, your, your sound is a bit, uh, is not very well. I think if you stay a bit back, is better. Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes that's yes. good. I just want to ask a question on best practice within the organization. Do you advocate that an organization looking to develop um, this process should look at operating from a dedicated area, like a design, design room where the cross functional teams come together? Where you have your whiteboards, where you just have the mental thinking is more precise than if you was actually having it in mm -hmm. I, I do think, as I look at the organizations that are really making progress with this, there's two things I notice. One is the physical space, and I think you're, you're, uh, uh, you, you raise an important point there, Clive. Uh, physical space matters. The design of the physical space makes certain kinds of behavior easy and certain kinds of behavior challenging. Uh, for instance, when we started teaching design thinking at my school, we're a case method school. We have those tiered classrooms. So if you've ever been in one of the amphitheater rooms, they're all tiered, the desks are fixed. You can't do collaborative group work in that room. I mean, it just really doesn't lend itself to it. We actually had to make new space in order to, to teach design thinking that was flat and that had round tables that moved around and completely different physical space. Now, could we have done it in the old tiered classrooms? Maybe, but it would have been a lot harder. It would have, the, the room would have gotten in people's ways. And so I think creating physical space is important and sometimes that physical space doesn't have a lot of demands. It just needs big blank walls. I mean, on the wall behind us, we've got some of the posters up. You need to be able to have a blank wall that's not covered with bad corporate artwork so that you can actually hang your posters up and people can look at them. And if you can have a war room where you keep that stuff up and people can go to that room and be visually stimulated by the work you've already done to go to the next step, I think that really matters. And I think the second thing, just quickly, is organizations have set up these, uh, these kind of centralized design services groups, and their job is not to do design projects for people. It's to work with, with managers who want to do these to coach them and help them get better at it. And I think that's really positive, too. When we're first doing this, it's hard. It's different. Having people around who've done it, who can coach you, not do it for you, but coach you, really 
helps people feel more comfortable in the early parts of these projects. So I think, you know, my wish list is those two things. Some coaches who are around to help and some physical space that really lends itself to it. And maybe, uh, Linda, it looks like maybe we have a minute left. Do, do you have a, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you have a quick question you'd like to ask? Looks like you're muted still. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. You probably yeah, would have could to Could you unmute. unmute yourself, Linda, please? Linda, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, I think, yeah, just, just, uh, let me check your mute button. Yeah, try speaking now, please. Um, your mute button is still on. Okay. Linda, you, you yeah. still have the mute on. You have to, to click on the mute button in your in your screen. Yeah. Linda, it's in the microphone. Yeah, I don't think it's working. Well, you know what? I think maybe maybe next time we do this, we could get Linda in. Uh -huh. um, because I, I want to respect people's time, and I see yeah. it's 10 o'clock, uh, and I want to first thank everybody who who joined us to talk, Clive and Demola and Dore and Lisa and Ramesh and Stefano and Linda, apologies for not getting you in, but it's been terrific to have your questions. Uh, they've been fantastic questions, and thank you to everyone else who's joined us. I hope you found this useful. We, we'd like to try it again. Uh, over the, the coming weeks that we've got left in the course. So please send us your feedback about what worked for you and what didn't. And uh, we'll, we'll try and put together another conversation like this uh, a little bit later in the course. So again, thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful having a chance to at least meet some of you face to face and have a conversation. And I'll look forward to doing it again. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, please post the suggestions in the forums. There is a specific forum for each Hangout. And on Monday, you also can post your questions there. We will try to address um, the most voted ones. And yeah, please keep in um, with your feedback. It has been great so far. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. OK. And thank you to Luis as my final comment, the man who makes all this happen. OK. Thanks a lot. Everybody, have a great, well, in the US, we're going to get you getting ready to have a great rest of the day. So uh, whatever time zone you're in, I hope what's left is, is terrific. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.